As a Canadian artist living on the West Coast, I create shapes on canvas which emerge both from my imagination and from the profusion of forms in the coastal rainforest. When I was a child, my backyard was the Capilano Canyon on Vancouver's North Shore. The shapes made by the trees and undergrowth in the forest created a world where my fantasies could run amok. Most of my adventures ended up here, down by these natural pools made by the Capilano River. This area became a second world for me where I could escape into the primal forces of nature. It's a creative place and led me to want to create something myself. I love the raw, organic energy of this landscape. I moved with my family to West Vancouver when I was six. The house I grew up in was an architectural show home designed in the modernist style by my father, Doug Simpson. At the time, he was a pioneer of the West Coast style of architecture. My father had a mural painted by local artist John Corner, and it ran right down the side of the uh, family room and out onto the terraces. It was very uh, geometric and contained all kinds of shapes that I would study by the hour. Looking at this mural uh, constantly gave me an awful lot of ideas uh, visually and produced uh, an interesting contrast with the rainforest setting. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting uh, duality was formed really by this precise geometric uh, mural uh, contained within extreme shapes of trees and roots and ferns. So it was an interesting uh, paradigm that was created there with those two elements. The contrast between the cool modernist lines of the house and the tangled web of the forest generated a tension that I needed to find a way to express. When I was a teenager, I remember discovering the work of Max Ernst in my school library. His approach to nature conditioned mine and made me want to be the kind of artist who penetrated the fantastic world of forms suggested by the forest, but not limited by it. I used to sense uh, magic was in this natural setting here, and I still do. As an artist, it's something I can always draw on, whether it was the trees or these natural pools here by the side of the river, the sheer cliffs that come down with the trees that grow out of them. It's an almost impossibly beautiful spot. It's my west coast, it's sort of where I grew up, and I think it probably had a big influence on my work as an artist. Today, painters like myself, who are doing landscape painting, and uh, people like Greg Simpson, who are doing abstract work which really comes out of landscape. In the end, we are all regional painters because we have to come out of our own experience. As an abstract painter in BC, I find that uh, the best you can do with landscape is often to represent a, a, a detail of it or a, a sort of an inner force to it, the dynamism of nature. In a lot of the art in British Columbia, there's a strong tradition connecting a spirit and landscape. Native art contains organic shapes like ovoids with strong outlines and colors, particularly red and black. In the mid-1980s, I was obsessed with the ovoid shape. Uh, it began to look almost embryonic. usually start a painting by flooding the canvas with water and then laying down strokes in a manner almost like calligraphy. I gradually build the strokes into forms and then by adding more color and more outlines I transform those shapes into a mosaic of color. When it works it becomes something that has a resonance for me. The painting tells me what to do next.
The first uh, works that I was uh, known for, I believe, was in the late 1960s, early 70s, the uh, collages and used history books and uh, old engravings and industrial shots. In the same period, uh, I was doing a lot of uh, hard edge kind of pop influence painting. Greg Simpson. I'm more aware of the paintings he has done later on, the, um, the uh, Magritte-like, I think the period where he was most influenced by Magritte, and which in fact, it's another also definition of surrealism. Breton was saying, if you look very closely in everyday life, there is always something very strange. And this is what Magritte was painting, but I think this is also what at a certain period Greg Simpson was painting. The, the strangeness of, of objects that you observe that suddenly they appear to you very, very uh, unusual. And also what you encounter by chance, uh, what you don't expect. It's true that Greg Simpson was highly influenced by Max Ernst at a certain, peri at a certain period of his life. And he used uh, all his techniques like such as frottage, grattage, Fumage. Uh, frottage, yeah, that's um, like a, a sort of a kid's game that they draw on a uh, paper that's on, with a penny underneath and it brings the impression of the penny through. Uh, so I've, I used that as, again as a, a tool to liberate myself from starting with a preconceived idea. It's very much not preconceived. The technique of grattage is uh, where you put a colored ground down first, different colors. Uh, you put on black paint on top of that, usually covering the whole surface. And then you scrape it off using various implements and it leaves traces of, of the color underneath. Fumage is another technique where you use a paraffin candle and you hold it underneath a, a white card or something that won't catch fire. And the smoke will trace patterns on it. Again, extremely spontaneously, you can't really control it. The only difference I brought to it was that, I, like frottage, I used a, a, a grid and I filtered the smoke through it and it made patterns. Decalcomania was a technique I used in the uh, early 70s and trying to get something more spontaneous going. Decalcomania is a, a very difficult uh, technique, putting gouache on a piece of paper and uh, uh, applying another piece of paper over it and pressing with the hand and drawing uh, sort of uh, blindfolded because you do not know what the result will be and then lifting the paper and seeing uh, the result. The classical um, decalcomania is in black and white. Uh, Greg went to color. Once I switched from the black and white though, it took on a different feeling. Again, more lyrical. I was using colored uh, gouaches, a sort of watercolor paint, and uh, created some more interesting uh, uh, images. You're still getting the effect of decalcomania, which is a sort of subterranean caverns and strange flora and fauna. During the early 1970s, I took my Surrealist-inspired works to Paris, where they attracted the attention of French art critic and historian José Pierre, a member of the post-war Surrealist group with André Breton, its founder. José Pierre did emphasize the West Coast uh, uh, very much. And he wrote his book entitled L'Univers Surrealiste. It was published, I believe, in 1983. And uh, he reproduced a painting uh, by Greg Simpson. I don't think uh, um, it is only uh, José Pierre that recognized Greg Simpson uh, as an international artist, but also Saran Alexandrian. Eventually I met Saran Alexandrian, who was one of the historians with Breton in the late 40s, the post-war surrealist group in Paris, and published my work in Superior and Connu, which was a great honor because he'd started it the year I was born, 1947. In the late uh, 1970s and early 80s, I started moving from the sort of drawn out, planned out paintings and these sort of dreamscape interiors into an automaticist abstraction. I find the physical process of, of Mark making and painting and, and uh, 
building of forms leads one into a, a, a subject. By building forms and then subtracting forms and uh, redelineating shapes, uh, one achieves uh, a balance that uh, can only be uh, uh, arrived at through a long process of uh, building and uh, shaping. And it's not done in one go, let's put it that way. I've had uh, parallel careers in music and art, uh, but never one at the expense of the other. Uh, however, there are certain similarities in improvising music and improvising uh, a piece of art. So the two mediums have, to me, gone always gone together. Music is nearly absent in the European movement under André Breton. However, in Vancouver and the West Coast, um, at the inception uh, of this effervescence, music uh, was of great importance. And Greg is not only a visual artist, he is also a talented percussionist. There's so much rhythm in his paintings, it's, it's so musical uh, in its intent. In fact, uh, one day when uh, uh, this uh, friend of mine uh, and her son were over, we were having dinner in the kitchen, and her son disappeared. Uh, her son Adam is 23, and he was standing in front of this painting. Just, he said, I've been here five minutes looking at this painting. You know, it's so musical, it must have been painted by a musician. Greg's painting became uh, more abstract, undoubtedly a, a great sense of design, a great sense of composition, a great sense of rhythm, and we timidly linked to music. Uh, when I was just out of high school, I was 18, I rented a place in Kitsilano, an old storefront, and uh, used it as a painting studio, uh, drawing from the model there, actually. And uh, then we started rehearsing with the Al Neal Trio. It went on for a number of years, but uh, we rehearsed there and then started putting on weekend performances that were discharged to people a donation. We started getting involved with other filmmakers and dancers and poets. We all know about the history of artist-run centers, and Greg was a part of the Sound Gallery, which was um, a, a multimedia space that they set up, kind of this psychedelic space they set up in the, the mid-60s. And Greg had a, a huge role in that. He was one of the first creative people involved in the Sound Gallery, which really was the, the genesis of all the multimedia stuff going on in the city today. Uh, eventually we outgrew the space of the sound gallery and moved downtown to a, a bigger space we called Motion Studio. Uh, we had poets again, dancers, the Helen Goodwin dancers, and in 1967 Intermedia came along, a multimedia collective of artists working with no fixed program at all and uh, it was very free. Intermedia gave birth to a lot of different movements, but, but two major ones kind of grew out of it. Uh, the main one was photoconceptualism. Um, definitely they would trace their history back to Intermedia because they were experimenting with slides and, and photography, which at that time was new. And then the other direction that it went and that it gave birth to that is less well known is the surrealism and, and the painters like Greg Simpson. But I think they get a lot less recognition so even though they gave birth to this movement um, they're now sort of uh, seen as very separate from the photoconceptualists when ironically they both grew out of the late 60s early 70s. During the 10 years that followed the intermediate period uh, my work went through an pop influences of the 60s to a type of neo-surrealism. Then I began a shift by way of some freeform drawings to a kind of organic abstraction. 
Uh, I would uh, pour paint directly onto the canvas and uh, let it flow in different patterns, uh, kind of letting gravity do the work initially and then follow it up with a lot of meticulous overpainting to bring out certain shapes and areas. In 1994, I returned to Europe after a break of about 20 years and traveled extensively through Italy and France. In Brittany, the uh, stone alignments seemed to have a relationship to the configurations on the beaches, so I studied the forms and translated them into paintings, and I later did the same in the Fontainebleau Forest, which uh, is a venerable subject of 19th century French landscape painting. The first day in the south of France, I took a trip to the uh, Fondation Mate in the hills above Nice and was uh, struck by the uh, arrangement of uh, sculptures in their gardens there to, together with the trees. The experience of seeing the uh, Mate Foundation garden led me to do a series of uh, works uh, reminiscent of cloisonism. The cloisonist idea of uh, faceting the imagery, he would look at the foliage, the trees, the landscape, and break it down and abstract it into basic shapes. And the structure uh, and his ability to, you know, to create that structure and show the imagery through the structure was uh, just outstanding and very, very strong paintings. In 2000, I was invited to show at a 14th century castle called the Fortezza di Montalcino. Montalcino is in the heart of Tuscany, just south of Siena. One morning I found an email from the commune of Montalcino asking me if I wanted my exhibition at the Fortezza in November of this year or May of the next year, 2000. So, needless to say, I thought that May was a better time to be there. I had to select works that would provide a strong contrast to the stone walls of the castle. Big paintings were needed to make any kind of an impact. I felt like I was time traveling, like the clock had gone back a thousand years and that the only things modern about it at all were my paintings.
very much. I called the exhibition A New Arcadia after this painting. In ancient times, Arcadia referred to an idealized pastoral world. I wanted to combine the elements from this classical world with the primal energy of the Pacific West Coast. That's what I mean by a new Arcadia, the mixing together of the old and new worlds. Back home after the exhibition, I'm starting to take a freer, more gestural approach to painting, alternately creating and destroying any semblance of an image. like there's a total improvisation where the ideas for the forms are coming out of the improvising. Mm -hmm. oh, That's yeah. like when I started painting with completely free form markings and I have no idea what it's going to end up like and it takes yeah. about 15 layers before you know what you're doing. Right. Then you can see it. But then, so then you, you, but you trust forms? that process the whole time though. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You probably worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got no choice. Yeah. The works that I've been doing since the exhibition at the Forteza with the Cloisonous series have been looser and more abstract. You could almost interpret them any way you want. My goal is still to capture and paint on canvas a process of transformation of the physical world through the inner eye to the finished work of art. 